Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Lahari here and this is the second part of the Panoramic Radiography Lecture. The learning outcomes would be similar to the first part where we're discussing about the introduction principle technique, advantages and disadvantages of panoramic radiography, normal anatomy, detecting gross pathology, as well as errors on panoramic radiography. So if you were to look at the uses or indications of panoramic radiography, most important ones are bony lesions, unerupted teeth, we use it for assessment of wisdom teeth prior to surgical intervention, grossly neglected mouth to assess periodontal bone support when the pocket depth is greater than 6 mm, orthodontic assessment, very essential tool, fractures of mandible, antral disease, that means diseases of the sinuses, especially the maxillary sinus, the floor, posterior and median walls are clearly visible. Destructive diseases of articular surface of the TMJ when you have to do gross evaluation and uh, not for minor evaluation or, uh, micro or uh, very detailed evaluation is for gross pathology evaluation and also for pre-implant planning when you want to assess the um, vertical alveolar bone height. Let us look at some of the images to understand um, where and how panoramic image can be useful in diagnosis. So I have used uh, most of the images from our own archive for the education purpose. And this is an example of a grossly neglected cavity where you're seeing multiple decayed teeth with multiple periapical pathologies. Okay, most of these teeth are indicated for extraction and all teeth that are indicated for extraction must be imaged. So in this case, the doctor has chosen to prescribe a panoramic radiograph because it has a wide, wide range of teeth which can be covered and also gives you an assessment of the bone height so that the patient can then receive a denture afterwards. For periodontitis, like we discussed, in cases where there is severe bone loss, horizontal as well as angular bone loss, it's a very important tool in assessment. So you can assess greater than 6 mm bone loss, vertical bone loss, and also furcation involvement, which can be clearly seen. Mixed dentition, yes, of course, is of great value in understanding where the uh, location of the unerupted or uh, predecessor teeth are, sorry, the success, successive teeth are. It also gives you an idea that they could be supernumerary, unerupted, or unerupted permanent teeth and helps you analyze uh, what the location of this teeth is. Having said that, children, again, uh, you should be cautious while exposing children to panoramic radiographs. Impacted canines, for example, are seen in this case bilaterally, and they're having a dental a normal follicle. Just to remind you that dental follicle is a space around an unerupted tooth, and this should not be greater than 5 mm. And if it is greater than 5 mm, then it is an indication that it could be having a cyst around it, most likely a dentigerous cyst. It's important tip when you are looking at an image like this uh, and you are unsure is to use another view from a different angle, perhaps already have taken a periapical or an occlusal view. And if you're still in doubt or in suspicion, you could then take a CBCT if the teeth are indicated for surgery. For impacted third molars, this is a really important tool. Um, you can see different uh, cropped images taken from different impacted uh, uh, third molar uh, panoramic radiographs. Uh, mind you, these are cropped images of the panoramic radiograph. And you can see mesioangular, distoangular, horizontal and vertical impractions. And this is a very uh, useful tool in understanding the war lines or the winter lines which gives you the white amber and the red line to get you an in-detailed assessment of how difficult the extraction could be. More on impacted uh, teeth, you're looking at an impacted canine here but what is interesting in this uh, uh, radiograph image is that there's a considerable displacement of the maxillary anterior teeth plate close attention there and you will notice that there's a large radiolucency so for sure definitely there is some cyst uh, involved and this most likely looks like a dentigerous cyst involved with an impacted tooth 
So differential diagnosis on the radiograph, mind you, this is radiographic differential diagnosis, would be an odontogenic keratocyst, uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor, or calcifying odontogenic cyst based on the location and um, likelihood of the occurrence of the lesion. Implant placement, again, panoramic radiograph acts as a scout image or a preliminary image that you would want to do before placing the implant. Um, there are important tips that you need to know. Screening image prior to planning implant should be a panoramic image. For implant site itself evaluation procedure, the preferred imaging methodology is a CBCT. And for follow-up of the implant, panoramic or periapical radiographs can be taken. Again, we have more uh, imaging of the implant placement, whether the implant has been placed successfully or no. Uh, this is to understand how close it is to the maxillary sinus floor, and, and this implant is doing pretty reasonably well. This is an interesting case of one patient whom I personally seen, where the patient came back with pain after wearing the dentures for a couple of uh, years. The reason was the ridge had further resolved and this tooth popped out from nowhere. So this was one decayed and impacted tooth which was buried under the soft tissue. And generally, edentulousness happens over a period of time and probably the patient wasn't radiographed before the denture was placed. And after a couple of years of denture wearing, he realized that he had pain in one particular area. And when imaging was done, you find this impacted tooth there, lying there, which was got, which has got decayed because it was already exposed to the oral cavity. Of course, for panoramic, uh, for uh, panoramic radiographs are excellent imaging for uh, patients who have to wear braces, who are indicated for orthodontics and post treatment as well. But sometimes during the treatment, you get unexpected issues like these. For example, this is a case of uh, non-vital uh, 4-1 <clears throat> anterior teeth, which has got non-vital because of probably um, force during orthodontic treatment. And you can also see that the cystic area has actually caused the drifting of the root of the um, canine. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a 4-2, probably I got the tooth number wrong. Yeah, more well-defined radiolucencies. This one is a large radiolucency, and based on the size, you can say that it's nearly six times three mm in size, uh, six times three cm in size. Sorry, and having a very scalloped appearance with uh, multiple locules, <coughs> and the borders have actually caused resorption of the adjacent teeth. So uh, this would definitely uh, be an OKC or an aminoblastoma. It's very important to understand how close it is to the mandibular canal. And in this case, certainly the mandibular canal is involved. Radio opacities, uh, mo sorry, moving on to another radiolucency is this particular tooth, which was also in a patient who was getting orthodontic treatment done. You can see that the seven is also uh, submerged in the oral cavity. We're talking about the three seven here and the radiolucency associated with it, which could be an OKC or an amyloblastoma on the radiograph. So it's impossible for us to very clearly tell whether it's an OKC or an amyloblastoma. Histopathology would have to be done for confirmation, uh, confused for lesions. That is what I was talking to you about. Air shadows. Well-defined radio opacities like the one seen here looks pretty uh, benign and harmless. And this happens to be an idiopathic osteosclerosis or a dense bone island. There is no treatment indicated for this and it's just left that way. Diffuse radio opacities can also be seen on panoramic radiographs very clearly like the one seen in the right side fourth quadrant where you can see a large diffuse area the borders are uh, merging with normal bone but definitely you see that there is change in trabecular pattern the entire bone appears opacified and ground glass like and this is uh, either a cemento ossifying fibroma or fibrous dysplasia of the mandible 
Moving on to trauma, panoramic radiographs can be very useful when you're looking at trauma. Uh, this is an example of mandibular fracture of the left side angle, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, angle and subcondylar fractures. The angle fracture is on the right side of the mandible, subcondylar is on the left side. So clinically, if you were to examine this angle fracture, you would be able to palpate a step deformity. Trauma cases after management and healing also panoramic radiographs are taken to understand how well the healing has happened. For example, this is a case where bone plating has been done in multiple areas to hold the jaw together, hold the fractured fragments together and, and this patient has healed very well. You can see that the bone has fused and the metal plates will remain there in the patient's bone forever. So, based on all the panoramic radiographs that you have seen, we've got an idea as to how the image can be useful in diagnosis of various conditions. Now, like it, let us look at some common positioning errors. Now, if the patient is placed too forward in the focal trough and the neck is bent, you might get an exaggerated smile line and the gonial angles pop out like this and this image is not very diagnostic. If your patient is positioned too forward, as uh, too posteriorly in the focal trough, you get these uh, flattened out, fattened teeth in the center and the smile line of the panoramic is just flattened. So again, the uh, central area is blurred because they have gone out of focus and are not in the focal trough. If the jaw is positioned asymmetrically, that means the patient is not put center, has not been taken, or the patient has done a little bit of movement during the x-ray taking, you will notice that there is specific blurring in one particular area because of move, patient movement. And also one side of the jaw is appearing wider than the other side. Lead apron artifacts, if the patient has a short neck or hasn't been positioned properly, then you would see that the lead apron, which covers the chest of the patient and the shoulders, uh, actually ends up casting a shadow because it is getting in the way of the x-ray machine and casting a shadow. And it is not supposed to. And this is, again, a non-diagnostic film which cannot be used and it has to be repeated. This is again a picture of patient movement. Patient was placed too forward and high and the chin was not resting on the, uh, on the uh, chin support and it has ended up cutting off the condyles of the patient. Uh, and obviously this image is non-diagnostic and has to be repeated. It has a heavy shadow of the spine and a totally um, indicative of a non-diagnostic image. Right. Now let's look at some commonly mistaken areas. Is this, for example, looks like a nice panoramic radiograph, but what we see here is a very prominent air shadow, probably blood vessels within the um, sinus and the uh, nasal region. And for example, this area here pointed out shouldn't be in yellow, shouldn't be mistaken for a radiolucency. And the ones which are pointed on the pink circles, we are so busy concentrating on the canine that is impacted here or the, probably the lateral, I can't make out here right now, uh, the tooth that is impacted here that you totally forget this is there is a tooth impacted high up in the uh, maxilla which could have been totally forgotten. So that is why it's important to pay close attention and spend some time diagnosing a panoramic radiograph. All in all, let's look at the strengths and limitations of panoramic radiographs. First of all, it has a broad area of coverage, low patient uh, radiation dose, again relatively low. Ease and convenience of uh, uh, examining the patient, it uses in case of trismus and useful visual aid in patient education and case presentation. Yes, of course. The limitations would be lower resolution than intraoral radiograph and hence it cannot provide you fine details. So it cannot be used as a radiograph to uh, look at RCTs or caries diagnosis. 
there is magnification of image uh, and the measurements are not reliable hence it has to be used uh, the software has to be used to get the exact measurements so what we see on the screen is a slightly magnified image of your jaws probably 1 to 1.8 percent magnification there is superimposition of real double and ghost images which we have seen in all of the images that we just examined and uh, this can be quite difficult to uh, delineate unless you have studied the image thoroughly and requires accurate patient positioning. We have again seen that due to common errors that can happen if the patient is not positioned carefully within the jaws, uh, within the machine in the, pan in the focal trough. So, panoramic radiograph may not be a great choice for RCTs detecting proximal caries, mid-facial trauma or cervical spine injury, TMJ details, implant surgery, and again, very important to understand that it's important to avoid exposure to the thyroid gland because the thyroid gland is not getting covered with the panoramic, uh, with the lead apron. And hence, especially in children, you might not want to expose them to panoramic radiographs too often. So, uh, some of these can be um, replaced or done with an intraoral radiograph. And the others, you might require a CBCT uh, or a CT scan to visualize the uh, details. So the take-home message is panoramic x-ray is a complex image of jaws with multiple superimposition of structures outside the jaws. Knowledge of basic anatomy is key to better understanding. Systemic and repeated approach to interpretation is recommended. And use best practices in imaging and protection and pay attention to details. So that was about panoramic imaging. If you have any doubts, please feel free to contact me and I would be happy to clarify them to you. And um, these are my references and uh, thank you very much.